Well, thank you very much indeed for that kind introduction, Maureen. And thanks to all of you who've managed to get up at this very early hour on a Sunday morning to come in and talk about economics, finance, and wealth. It's an issue which I'm sure is of great interest to many of you personally in this room. I mean, we are in Aspen. Um, but it's an issue which is also of great interest right now to the media and policymakers ever since a man called Thomas Piketty, um, an obscure French left-wing economist, intellectual, um, turned into an unlikely rock star on the New York literary scene. And to me, there are two fascinating things that have happened in relation to Piketty in recent months. One is that Piketty, as many of you know, shot to the top of the New York Times bestseller list with his book about um, inequality, which is quite remarkable because he actually beat two literary adaptations of the movie Frozen, <laughs> which I find incredible. You know. um, but secondly, we have at the FT have noticed that every time we write anything at all to do with inequality, wealth, um, and let alone mention Piketty's name right now, in the pages of the FT, anything we write sh shoots almost immediately to the top of the list of the most read columns or most read news articles on the FT. Quite astonishing. It even beats the issue that normally makes columns most read, which is gold. So it's striking. But what we're going to be talking about today is not really so much to do with inequality. Um, it's more to do with the fascinating question of how our attitudes towards wealth and using wealth and investing wealth changing amongst the millennium generation. How do the current generation of wealthy kids, I mean kids to most of us in the room, but you know, young adults, how do they view wealth? How do they use it differently from their parents? Because there are some absolutely fascinating changes that are underway at the moment that we're going to be hearing about. And I can't think of a better person to talk about this than Keith Banks, who's president of US Trust. Um, from his position as someone who's been at the center of wealth management in recent years, you've seen his changing attitudes, and you've just done a very large survey looking at attitudes towards wealth amongst the millennium generation which is fascinating, which you're going to be talking about today. But before we switch to the question of you know, what, the wealth, what people, young wealthy people today are doing with their money, I'd like to just start by asking a quick question that I know you're keen to talk about and will get the attention of most of you in the room right now, which is when you look at the economy today and the stock market, see the remarkable run-up of the stock market that's occurred, do you think the recovery is for real today, both in terms of the economy and the stock market? We, we do. Um, you know, we, we have the, we just celebrated the fifth anniversary actually this, this month of both the economic recovery and the bull market. And I know a lot of people just because of duration alone uh, and how far the, the, uh, the markets in particular have come are concerned that we may be at the, the end innings of the game here. With the information we look at, the data we see, um, we think we're more at the early to mid part of the cycle. Um, there's a lot of concern out there right now, given how terrible the first quarter was, uh, and a lot of skepticism. The, people believe, yeah, it was the weather, but is there more to it? Is this the beginning of the end? And we just don't see that. And we look at a number of things, Jillian, and l let me share them with the audience. Number one, um, you're going to see a snapback, mainly because uh, if you look at the, um, like, for instance, auto sales, auto sales dropped at a 22% annualized rate, which is remarkable, between December and February. It's already come back at twice that rate, and in, and in part of the process of that, we've seen inventories drawn down dramatically. So already the, the auto companies are saying over the next two or three quarters at least, they've got to ramp up production just to restock. That's happening with production overall. So I think some of the things that led to the the first quarter are already in the process of being corrected for. We think at U.S. Trust that we're going to see growth between 3 and 4 percent in the second, third, and fourth quarters because that, in our mind, is, the, is more of the trajectory when you, when you take away the, the influence of weather. Okay, so you're bullish about the U.S. economy. Um, I'm sure there'll be plenty in the pe people in the room who have views about that and we can have questions afterwards. But what does that mean for the stock market? Because we've seen a pretty dramatic run-up on that. Um, pretty dramatic run-up in bond prices too. Plenty right. of people would say that's just because the world's central banks are pumping money into the economy, um, and that could pretty quickly um, evaporate. 
So it, we're, um, we're still bullish on equities. We've been overweight, recommending clients be overweight equities for some time now. And the reason we're still bullish is number one, we do, if you believe what we believe about the economy, um, we see an accelerating growth in the U.S. and globally. As a result of that, you're going to see another year of record profits in the S&P in 2014. We think this year profits will come in around $118 uh, per share. Uh, next year, we think that number will come in between $126 and $130 per share. We look at valuation, and we think stocks are fairly valued meaning they're not over or under. And what that implies is that the, the markets, the equity markets, should increase with economic, with um, profit growth. So if you expect profits to grow as we do, six to eight percent this next year and the year after, uh, it, it tells you equities continue to be a good place to be. And, and the reason why we think the, the economy will sustain, we look at three things. Number one, if you look at monetary policy, so monetary policy uh, right now, the Fed is in the early, it's gotten a lot of headlines, but the Fed is only in the first year of a rate normalization process. They're only tapering right now, meaning they're just starting to pull in that excess liquidity that's been provided. We don't think rates will start to raise and rise until next year. And, and with respect to rising rates, in 1994, when the Fed began to raise rates, the economy grew for six more years. And in 2004, when the Fed raised rates, the economy grew for four more years. So we think we're early innings as far as that goes. And even when rates begin to rise, it doesn't mean that the, the switch gets put to off. The other thing we look at is capacity utilization. So when utilization gets to around 80%, people get nervous because you start to see production bottlenecks. We think we're a few years away from that. Um, and even then, with, with automation, robotics, we don't think you'll see the same strains. And the last piece of the puzzle, which is a very important one, is liquidity. And we look at liquidity in the credit markets and liquidity just in the system itself. And with respect to credit markets, the thing to keep an eye on is the spread between 10-year Treasury yields and the yields on high and high yield rates. And right now, that rate is less than, that spread is less than 4%. Typically, if you're getting near the end innings, getting closer to a recession, that spread gaps out. And the other thing which is very powerful, and people forget this, U.S. companies, non-financial U.S. companies have $1.6 trillion of cash sitting on their balance sheets. And what are they doing? They're buying back stock and they're raising dividends, good for equities. They, we think this is the first year where they're going to start to really put money back into capital spending because they have to and need to. Um, and so we just don't see liquidity being an issue, all of which, in addition to just the economy itself doing well, we think we have a ways to go. Well, that's a fascinating set of points. Um, I must say, I could frankly have an entire session on each of those points because many of them raise many questions. And in fact, I just flew in yesterday from a meeting of central bank governors in Switzerland, which I was chairing. And um, I must say, the view amongst the central bank governors was not quite the same. Right. Not quite as optimistic, but let's leave that to the side um, because it's a beautiful sunny morning and let's choose to be wildly optimistic and believe everything you say and let's hope you're right because I have vested interest. I like that tact. I like that tact. <laughs> exactly. Well, I personally have an interest in hoping you're right. But, um, so let's assume you're right, but let's turn to the key issue, which is this. Okay, The outlook is wildly optimistic. Things are good. How do you see the current generation of wealthy individuals in America responding to this? Because you've just done a fascinating survey right. of people who have investable assets of between three and five million dollars. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Well, three and three and above. But. Okay, which might capture maybe a few of the people in the room. Um, and you're seeing really quite a sharp change in attitudes in terms of what they're actually doing with their money. Right. Can you perhaps start by saying, talking a little bit about who are the people today who are in that category in America? And how is that different from, say, 20, 30 years ago? Because this does pick up on some of the themes that piketty has been talking about that has been helping to sell books and newspapers. So if you, if you contrast the baby boomers with the millennials, so millennials being defined as individuals 35 years or younger, so the baby boomers gr grew up learning that if you put money into the equity market and let it stay there over long periods of time, you got your 8 9% compounded, and when you retired, that was your nest egg in addition to your, the equity you built up in your home. The millennials, as they came of age, they didn't quite see that. They saw two very dramatic 
pullbacks in the equity markets. One in 2000 to correct for the tech bubble, and then obviously uh, 2008, 2009 with the financial crisis. So they don't have that innate belief that if you trust in equities, it'll be okay, and then as a result, you, know, you don't have your traditional equity and fixed income asset allocation. What the millennials um, demonstrate is a proclivity for, number one, tangible assets. They like, they like real estate. They like having their assets in their own business. They like art, things they can see, feel, touch, and, and observe in that manner. Uh, they like uh, alternative investments, so they tend to have, where they have wealth, to have a much higher percentage of their wealth in hedge funds or, or other alternative investments, because again, it, it, it kind of comes back to the way they think. They, they trust their ability to be opportunistic. They tend to be entrepreneurial, um, which is, uh, again, I think consistent with that. Right. And, and so you see a very different approach to, to investing. Right. The other thing that's important is the millennials have a real passion for making a difference. When they exit stage right, they want to be able to look back and, and feel that their presence here made a difference in some profound way. Uh, and, and that directs where they put their money. They put money where they have things they have a passion for. Um, when they invest in companies, 75% of these respondents said that they are very focused on the social and environmental impact of the companies that they consider investing in. Again, very different. And they also are in search of that, again, back to the entrepreneurial spirit, that next big idea. They want to impact education and healthcare and, again, Im important things to the, to the economy and the world. And that's what really drives a lot of what they do and how they think. Right, so they don't trust equities. They're as much. As much. Um, although, if you're correct, they should be trusting equities, but they don't trust equities yet. We're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, they don't trust equities. They are entrepreneurial. Um, they're looking at alternatives. I guess you're saying they want to be in control, perhaps. Um, and they also want to leave a legacy. Right. Now, I guess one of the ironic things, though, is where have most of these millennials actually got their wealth from? And how does that differ from the baby boomer generation? No, it's a great question. So there's no doubt that, is, especially in the, in the technology world, you're seeing millennials, relatively young people, sometimes in their 20s, creating massive amounts of wealth, at least on paper, as they create these new ideas and, and they, they bring them public. But a, but a much greater percentage of millennials are also benefiting from inherited wealth. Um, that is not the case for baby boomers. The baby boomers that we survey, and the survey we do are, are non-US trust clients. Uh, so when we look at the survey and when we talk to our own clients, our typical client US trust created their own wealth. The typical baby boomer today with wealth created that wealth. They built that business, they had the idea. It was their blood, sweat, and tears over many, many years, and in some cases still continuing. And, and some people think and say that one of the reasons why the millennials are looking at the world differently with much more of a social lens and, and whatnot, perhaps in contrast to the, the baby boomers, is that they have the luxury of doing it. You know, the baby boomer in the midst of trying to build wealth and the, the, the strain and the focus that necessitates did not have the ability to step back and, and think about how they did greater good. They were worried about the business they were creating, taking care of the family they had, right. and um, that's one of the reasons we think there could be some difference in, in mindset. I mean, since I am paid to be a professional cynic, another explanation might be that the millennials have read Thomas Piketty and feel guilty and want to try and find a way of using their wealth almost to make amends. Do you see that as well? Or? Um, I don't see a lot of guilt, no. Uh, <laughs> I, there, there may, I think, look, what I will say, and this, and this is true of our baby boomer clients, of our clients in general, and this is where I think the wealthy are not depicted accurately. The, the, the clients that we serve at U.S. Trust, the clients we survey through the wealth and worth, they are incredibly philanthropic. They do believe, whether they're 80 or 50 or 70 or 30, if you have wealth, you have a duty to give back. And it's incredible the generosity that we see with our clients and the impact that, that they have in the areas that they are passionate about. So I, I think that's something that's shared across the board. We spend a lot of time with our clients on, on their philanthropic endeavors, advising them and whatnot. So I think that's just, I, I think wealthy people are much more inclined that way than the media and others give them credit for. I don't think that's a function of age so much. 
Well, I must say, as someone who was trained as a cultural anthropologist before I became a financial journalist, I'd say if I was looking at the Aspen you know, tribal gathering today as an anthropologist, <laughs> it's very much tapping into that vein as well with all kinds of rituals and totems and things. But anyway, um, I'd like... You know, Julian, one, one, can... <laughs> one, point, one point to the, your lead-in about inequality, and you and I talked about this earlier a little bit. Um, one, of, one of the misnomers when, when people look at the recovery we've seen and critique it is a lot of people do not believe that we've seen the same level of job creation that we typically see. The reality is we are. I think it's, you know, um, but, but, but there's a real dichotomy in the story. So if you look at individuals that have at least a college degree or higher, there have been 6.4 million jobs created since the recession ended. If you look at individuals who have a high school degree or less, there has been zero net gain in jobs. And so even though in aggregate the economy has seen a normal level of job creation in reality, it's bifurcated, I think, more than typically it would be, and that only exacerbates or reinforces that, that inequality issue you know, uh, that people are so interested in, and quite frankly, is, is, is a big challenge for the, the U.S. today. Absolutely. Well, I mean, the, the other area we were talking about beforehand was the question of who's still underwater in their mortgages in America today. And again, you're seeing a stark difference between the high-end houses that mostly have recovered in value right. and a very large proportion of the low-end houses that are still underwater, which again, adds to the sense that current policies are increasing the sense of inequality. Yeah, the interesting thing, one of the big surprises this year has been the fact that housing has stalled out, despite the fact that the economy's better, despite the fact that inventory is low, despite the fact that housing prices have risen. What people forget is there are 9.7 million households still underwater with respect to their mortgages. And to your point, again, when you peel back the, the onion a little bit, the, the, the lower tier households, the lower tiered homes, 30% of those homes are still underwater with respect to the mortgage. If you look at the top tier, only 10% are. And so what's happening is the, the people who own those homes tend to be the younger, the younger families. They're holding on to those homes longer, hoping prices will rise. So when they sell the house, they at least break even or make a little bit of yeah. money. So that's, that's stagnating the um, activity uh, in, in that right. regard. The other thing which is interesting is people also don't realize that three quarters of the home builders are Jillian and Keith Inc. It's the smaller home builder, right, the entrepreneur. They are still having trouble getting credit. So they're not seeing, you're not seeing the same level of activity from them, but the larger construction companies are getting the credit, have the credit, but they're focusing more on multifamily units. Right. And so that's why you're seeing this big surge in multifamily, but the single family is not doing what we all would have expected it to do. The, the, the good news in that, back to the glasses half full, uh, is we think we are 50% below peak production in, um, in, in homes home construction. I don't think we'll get back to peak, but we think we have a multi-year period of a normalization process where the production we see is more reflective of the underlying demographics, um, and, and that will be an important underpinning to the economy as well as we go forward. Right, right. Well, I know there's a lot to be said about inequality in the direction of the U.S. economy right now, but I don't want to dwell too much on that because that has been discussed a lot and there will be other panels. So I'd just like to come back to this question really of what the wealthy millennials are doing with their money. Because um, I say, you know, speaking as an anthropologist, it's absolutely fascinating to see the change in attitudes here. And I'm curious, um, do you expect this change of attitude amongst the millennials to continue? Or do you think that as they grow up, they will become like baby boomers and start believing you when you say you should all put your money in the equity market? Look, I think over time, um, as one's risk appetite changes, as one creates wealth, because don't forget, the millennials are also in the wealth creation phase, right? Yes, some have inherited wealth, and you can argue they're already <clears throat> wealthy to, to some degree or to a large degree, but many people in that age group uh, are still very much accumulating wealth and building wealth. So you have a different risk tolerance, a different objective. We see even with our clients, as time goes on, as they build that wealth, then you start shifting from wealth creation to wealth preservation. And I think at that point, depending on, and depending on what the, what the equity markets in fact do, and if we're right, 
and you start getting back to a more normal return level and sustained return level in equities, my expectation would be just over time, you'll see their asset allocation maybe still having a higher percentage geared toward alternatives because that's a little bit of their DNA. But I think their risk profile will morph over time and look more like the baby boomer predecessor, maybe not exactly, um, but, but it'll be, it's a dimmer switch, right? It's not gonna be an on-off, it'll take, it'll take time, but that would, be, that would be my expectation. Right, right. Well, that's fascinating. I'd like to just quickly ask, is there anybody in the room who would identify themselves as a millennial? Are we all baby boomers? Okay, I think about five of you. Um, <laughs> so I won't pick on all five of you to ask what you think, but um, it would be interesting to hear if any of you are millennials and brave enough to speak up. I'd be curious to hear whether you think you have a different attitude towards um, investment from your parents. But I'm going to stop here and allow plenty of time for questions and discussion in the audience because it is such a fascinating set of themes. And I'm sure a lot of you have got things you'd like to say, comment, or questions you'd like to ask. Um, I have two requests. One is, if you would like to make a comment or ask a question, please, as a courtesy, identify yourself. I mean, it's not compulsory, but it's courteous. And um, secondly, um, if you can keep your question or your comment very short, so that we can get as many of them as possible into the debate, that would be great. So I think there are some roving microphones around, and would any of you like to make a comment or ask a question? There's one in the back. One in the back. Hi, Jennifer Kurz with the Pisces Foundation. Thanks for your comments. My question is, do you see a carbon bubble now, maybe in the future, or a time to get out of carbon-laden assets? A carbon bubble? Carbon, yes, carbon-related assets. Um, you know, our, our view is the, the, the issue there is going to be um, a lot of what goes on geopolitically, right? We, uh, you know, we, we, even though we are constructive on the equity markets, uh, there are things to worry about. One of the things that we are concerned with right now is with geopolitical risk front and center. Um, and, you know, we've had oil, Brent has been in a fairly tight band from, call it $90 a barrel to 130 center point, 100 or so. Um, but we think we're starting to see that band shift to the right. And the risk is you see a spike. Um, you know, as we look at the world, if you think about the, gl the global economies growing at the rate we think they will, the emerging economies, China, although not 7%, maybe 5 to 6% long term, hopefully Europe can break out of the malaise they're in and not have one to two, but maybe two to three, or, and the U.S. continuing to do well, um, there's going to be a tremendous call on resources. Um, and part of that will be carbon-related resources. We're very bullish on agricultural commodities. One of the big themes that we've identified in our work also is the emerging market consumer. You know, as, P as the emerging economies come up and they create more and more middle class, it's, and the numbers are staggering, um, when people have middle class wealth, they want to consume like what they perceive middle class individuals consume. They consume energy, they consume, they buy cars, they, you know, they want to change their, their dietary, um, you know, uh, behavior and obviously begin to buy some of the nicer things one has. So there, there is an inexorable, I think, force out there that'll move around a little bit. It's, it's not gonna be straight up for you know, the next 10 years, but I think there'll be a lot of pressure, and I think the, the carbon-related commodities will be beneficiaries of that, but let's not forget they're cyclical, and you gotta, you gotta that's not a buy and hold. You gotta trade them around a little bit or you can get caught. We have a question, two questions, one, then two. Uh, I'm Robert Lehrman from the Lehrman Foundation in Washington, D.C. With the, <clears throat> you mentioned the enormous instability relating to global risks, which in the Middle East is, it seems, extraordinarily volatile now. How would that conflict affect the world and the U.S. economy if it goes from bad to worse and oil supplies are disrupted? Yeah, so um, I think it, it, it can and will affect it two ways. Number one, if things continue to escalate in a bad way, um, you can argue the, the risk premium associated with earning, uh, owning uh, assets like equities will go up, which means you could see the multiple potentially uh, compressed. So people will be willing to pay less you know, for that risk asset. So even if the 
earnings come through like we think they will, uh, people may be willing to pay less for those earnings and you can see a multiple compression. We're not seeing that now, we're not forecasting that, but that's certainly something we're keeping an eye on. To the point about uh, energy prices, we're extremely concerned. People don't realize, um, you know, in the U.S. there's been a, a literal energy revolution. And because of the, uh, the surge in production, you know, our gas production in the U.S., thanks to the Marcellus region, went from 2 billion cubic feet in 2010 to 13 billion cubic feet. We've had a five-fold production increase in oil uh, because of the Bakken um, and Eagleford fields. So we've, we've absorbed a lot of the, the you know, extraneous or exogenous shocks. That will not be enough to absorb a major shock in the Mideast or in, in, in Iraq in particular. And if you were to see oil go up beyond a certain level, um, you will begin to see global growth slow down and ultimately screech to a halt. Um, so that's one of the things that when you think, when if people ask me, what are, you, what are you worried about? Geopolitical for me is number one, uh, and it's all, the, all of that dynamic. A question over there. Uh, Mr. Banks, um, my name is Tom Strauss. I'm chairman of Ramius, an alternative asset management firm based in New York. Um, it's refreshing to wake up in the morning to such a um, positive outlook. Um, you either intentionally dodged or forgot that there's a municipal bond market with state and local governments which are really in awful shape at the moment, the worst in my uh, relatively long history. I'm definitely a baby boomer. Um, how does that factor into your thinking Detroit's filed for bankruptcy? I won't mention other states which are probably represented here, but clearly we're in a period of extremists where uh, pensioners, bondholders, and workers uh, in some fashion are going to have to give it the office in order to solve this problem? No, it, it's a good question. Um, so we have been, we kind of focused the conversation on equities, but you know, we have been negative on fixed income, so we are underweight fixed income relative to equities um, because we do believe if you subscribe to the economic scenario that I, I put forth, uh, you, you've got to then believe that rates will go higher. We think they will begin to do that next year. Um, we think this year, even though the 10-year Treasury surprised with how low it went and still is, we still think there's a good chance the 10-year Treasury um, ends the year at 3% or more. Um, so we're, we're concerned about the, the fixed income area in general. There's still a lot of money in fixed income, but you can't be out of fixed income. So we like credit better than Treasury. Um, we like corporates. We still think there's value there. And to your point, your, your question on munis, um, munis has become, I think when you look at munis, there's a lot of very visible issues and challenges, and that's just a reality in the muni market. But there are other munis in other regions that we believe um, the underlying fundamentals aren't bad, are getting somewhat better. There was a day when you could just put money in munis and, and go away and not worry about it. Now you have to, if you invest in munis, and we're telling people we do see some opportunity there, um, you've got to be very specific about the kinds of, the kinds of uh, paper you're buying. We like general obligation and, and um, paper backed by tax revenue. Uh, you've got to be very, very clear as to where you're betting. Obviously, you know, places like Detroit have some very, very significant issues. But I think I wouldn't, and we aren't painting a broad brush saying that all munis are, are toxic or problematic, but you have to be very active in where you're going in. You have to do the research. You have to know the bonds you're buying. You have to know the municipalities in which you're participating. And we've seen um, when you do that, and, and um, we have clients in munis, uh, the return has not been bad. So, um, but it's a, it's a different ball game, and one you have to go in with eyes wide open. Any more questions? Got um, one and then two. Hi, thanks. You mentioned that 75% of um, those surveyed indicated that social impact and environmental factors were the, were the guiding decisions in, in investment. Are you finding that millennials then um, are trending more towards social impact businesses over philanthropic investments, or um, is it just a parallel interest? Because as the rise of you know, social impact bonds and 
social impact investing has really has really grown. Um, I'm curious if that's actually decreased um, millennials' interest in philanthropy. That's I, a fast, fascinating question. It's, it's a great question. Uh, and then I'll, t I'll ask you the same question since you raised your hand and identify yourself as such. But um, no, we're seeing it parallel. I, I think, um, and again, we've got to remember, not every millennial has, has a level of wealth yet where they can do all the above. So I think millennials, where they have the ability, are philanthropic, again, want to put money in areas that are important to them and are. I'm seeing, I'm on a number of nonprofit boards back in New York where I'm based, and I'm, we're seeing more and more millennials getting involved at the board level, at, you know, or sub-board level intentionally, and, that's, and, the, and the nonprofits are courting these individuals. But I'm very encouraged by when I attend the meetings I attend and, and the events I attend, how many millennials are there because they want to be there, they believe in it, uh, and that's a great thing because ultimately they will inherit all of that, and, and, and we need that next generation coming in and, and taking the reins. But I think it's, uh, it's, it's in parallel. So where they are investing their money, you know, they certainly want to make money. They're not totally altruistic in that manner, but they want to make money with the kinds of companies that they feel are consistent with their own personal philosophy, whether it's environmental, as I said, or, or how, however else they, they view it. But it's a, it's a multi-pronged approach. But if you don't mind, I'd love to hear your view on uh, yeah, can we get that. the microphone back? Because, I mean, it'd be great to get some audience comments and things. Because this is a very interesting Sorry question. To turn, turn it's right. a very interesting question in terms of, you know, where the financial industry is going in the future and how markets, um, and not just philanthropy, are structured, but also how finance itself structures and tries right. to market itself. But would you? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I would exactly agree with that, that it's not, they're not mutually exclusive, but rather that um, I think most people would recognize that there are things that the nonprofit world achieves that private sector and government just can't. Right. And so for those causes, um, it is, it is um, very compelling for people who have the time to be able to commit to pure charity, pure philanthropy, and, non on, and the entire nonprofit world, whether it is through board membership or right. volunteerism or, or um, other programs. But when you think about, but, but if you know, millennials are thinking about where to invest their money for a return, that that, that money would be re, um, sort of reallocated from what, might, what baby boomers might have invested in to businesses that are inspiring from a social right. and environmental impact, but still hopefully financially you know, profitable. Right. So. Thank you. We have a question over there. And then uh, Donna Zarconi, good morning, Keith. Um, I'm with the Economic Club of Chicago. Uh, one of the questions that I had was uh, your comment about housing and, and will there be a rebound in single family homes? And we've heard from other sessions here about the migration back to urban centers. Uh, and I've seen other books written that say that we're never going to see the growth in suburbs and single family homes like we saw pre-recession. Can you comment on that? Yeah, there, there's definitely been a, um, a, a move back um, into more urban centers. But, you know, it's interesting. I just you know, what I observe in, in both where I live and then as I travel around, um, the, the activity in the suburbs is still pretty robust. Um, and I think, and I've also talked to a lot of friends that, you know, younger friends who live in the city today, but as they're contemplating having a family, are also thinking about maybe not raising that family, you know, in the city. So I think there's, there's countervailing forces there, but, you know, just, just think about, you know, the number of, um, you know, you know, between population growth, the number of, of, you know, every year young people that are, you know, at a, at a level of wealth that they can, can, you know, can contemplate owning their own home. I've got two children right now, our, my, my wife and I, where both of them right now are in the process of acquiring their first home. One's 33, one's 31. Uh, they both happen to be buying in the suburbs. But I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of firepower out there. So um, I, I don't think it'll be one at the expense of the other. Um, but it's something we got to keep an eye on. So, uh, but I, th I think both will, will benefit. And I think right now, and especially some of the cities like New York, you know, unless there is help being given, you know, I look at the, the price of buying a modest place in New York, you're talking millions of dollars, and not many people at that age can afford to make an investment on their own at that level. So you can still get, I think, some greater value in some of the more suburban areas. So maybe they start there and gravitate in when the financials allow, but. 
But I think in general, it's, it, I think it's going to be a, um, I don't think we will get back to peak levels. But the other thing that's helping the U.S. too, and you, and you see it in certain cities, whether it's Miami or New York, is the, the amount of international money coming in as well. I mean, it's, it's crazy amounts that are, you know, they, it's a great way to place to put their wealth and you buy a condo or a co-op in the city, whether it's Miami, New York, or other, you know, preferred locations. So there's a lot of competition right now for, um, for housing in, in the United States. And, and I think all that will manifest itself very positively um, over the next few years or more. We have a question over there and then one over there. And then, um, do you want to get the microphone just to... Good morning. I have two different questions. One is, why is there no mention of that generation between these two generations? Generation X or whatever you want to call it. And the next one would be, are there investment funds of various types, green investment funds, whose returns can maybe approach other funds? So, so just to clarify, so millennials are under the age of 35, aren't they? That's, that's how we're defined. Okay, and baby boomers are over the age of 50, is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, there's so a, the Xers would be in the... The Xers, okay. We should say, hands up who's an Xer in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm an exit too. <laughs> I think there aren't many of us, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, 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 uh, so on the exits, we didn't, we didn't meet. We, the, the interesting thing about our survey is it, it, it pretty much, so A, the survey caught all the age groups, and, and obviously we have clients in all the age groups, so it's not, but I think the, um, you know, the interesting kind of the barbell has been the boomer versus the millennial, so I think that's where the, the focus has been, and, and the, uh, um, and, I, and I think what we're seeing with the Xers, is it's, it's kind of the middle ground between the two. Um, you know, it's kind of the, almost the best, best of both in a way. They, a little more influenced by, I think, the, you know, the baby, baby boomer parents um, and, and, um, and, and more individualistic, but, but not as extreme, I think, as, and as different as the millennials have demonstrated, at least to date. You know, the question, Trammell, on the, um, you know, the socially innovative investing funds, I think initially, um, you know, when people decided to put their money there, they were less focused on the return and more the fact that they found a, a, a vehicle that they felt was consistent with their own principles and, and philosophy, but then kind of look back and realize that many of those vehicles were not in turn generating consistent or competitive returns. So I think more and more the, the, um, the evolution there is people want to be in those, those vehicles, but they expect those vehicles to generate an economic return and, and a competitive return. Uh, we've got one in, in U.S. Trust that we've had, and we've worked very hard to ensure that we, we capture both the social aspect of it, but it's a, it's, a, it's a product that people can feel good about the return that they're seeing. So I think more and more um, individuals are demanding both as they should, and one is not mutually exclusive of the other. So I think that's been a bit of an evolution, but, but not an unexpected one. Right. I think we have a question there. And then are there any questions on this side of the room? Anyone want to? OK, one over there next. OK. Good there morning. I'm Casey Waldron from Austin, Texas. I'm a securities lawyer for Charles Schwab Advisor Services, formerly with the SEC. And my question is, could you comment on the dark pool controversy and the new exchange that's been created? And do you think that the perception that our exchanges may not be fair contributes to the attitude that millennials have with regard to investing? Well, since I wrote a column about dark pools myself this week, it's an issue I'm particularly um, interested in. But um, yeah. yeah, are you worried about dark pools? Well, you know, we are. Um, you know, we've had some recent um, Barclays, I guess, most recently. There's some issues came to light there. Um, you know, we, these are areas that, that we need to understand better. Uh, we, we need to make more transparent. I think there's a lot of concern about the implications of is this now disadvantaging the mere mortal who's in there trying to, you know, against the, whether it's the, you know, uh, rapid trading type activity. Uh, I, I don't think, nor do we believe at U.S. Trust, the market is rigged. Um, but I think when you look at dark pools and, you know, the, the other issues that have been brought to light, I think it shows that, like everything, you need to peel back that onion and make sure you do understand how, how trades are being executed, how money is moving around, what the implications are, 
and we need to ensure we're not tipping that, that um, playing field in a way that is disadvantageous to you know, anyone but the biggest investors. So we're being um, very, I, I can't disclose how we're handling internally, but put it this way, we are very discerning with whom we do business with, whether it's Bank of America or US Trust, because we do a lot of trading ourselves on behalf of our clients, um, both within US Trust and the broader bank. And we are very, um, all this plays a, a factors into who we do business with, who our partners are. Um, so we are, we are concerned, we're focused, it's impacting how we are doing our business. I think that's happening, happening across the board. That will create accountability in and of itself, quite frankly, as more of the bigger right. institutional players kind of take a stance uh, in that regard. So um, I think there's a lot more to come. But I think like anything else, I think you, you know, some of the stuff, you, 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 it gets a bit extreme before all the facts are out. And I think people go to a, from A to Z. We've got to hit some of the letters in between, I think, to really understand the implications. But you say you just wrote something, Jillian? Yeah, I wrote something this week, actually, um, on this issue. And I'm just curious. I mean, does that mean that you wouldn't deal with a Barclays dark pool? I can't comment on that. But as I said, um, you know, we are... Um, we have choice with how we conduct business, and we just don't conduct business with anyone. So we are, we are very aware of, um, as a fiduciary, especially in US trust, uh, we have to make sure we are conducting our business in a way that's consistent with the fiduciary standards. So right. I, I can't disclose well, what we do or don't do, but just know that we're, you know, this is not something that is, un it, it, it's important to us. Well, if you believe in the self-healing um, properties of capitalism and markets, presumably there will be more pressure going forward for disclosure, right. not simply of trading patterns, but also how people like yourselves are or are not dealing with the issue. And look, Which, the as you say, should help force change. No, I think, I think th that, that dynamic, and I think, look, the regulators obviously uh, are well aware and focused, and they're doing their due diligence as we speak. So I think the combination of all of the above will... If, if things are out of kilter, we'll get them back in line. Well, as I say, let's hope so. No, I think it's important. Um, but we have a question there. Brad Keywell from Chicago. So this is probably more to Jillian than Keith, but both perhaps. I found it interesting that you started your comments talking about Piketty. And, um, and, and you're both a cultural anthropologist and a financial reporter in Europe. Why do you think that there's not, um, or maybe you think there has been, more conversation in light of Piketty about the fact that the U.S. specifically is, I think, the most philanthropic country in, in the world in terms of wealth. Um, and why is that not more of a, of, an, of a contra to his philosophy, at least in popular press? Well, I'd be interested to hear your views. My views, Absolutely. for what it's worth, are that the reason why Thomas Piketty has been so extraordinarily popular in terms of his book sales is because he has helped to articulate and frame something that many Americans have been aware of for some time but have not really had a vehicle to actually articulate it which is that the American dream um, is facing some big internal contradictions today in that inequality has historically been justified in America by a perception that even though there's, there's inequality of outcome there's in, 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 there's equality of opportunity, and that it was okay to tolerate differences in wealth because everybody had a chance to get rich. And I think many Americans would recognize that that has, or instinctively know, that that dynamic has been changing in recent years, and we can argue about the degree to which that is or is not true. Um, and that creates problems for the sort of, you know, rhetorical myth which is so central to holding the nation together. So that's my own personal take on why Piketty has struck such a raw nerve. And philanthropy has been one big difference between, you know, one thing that's very much captured the difference between Europe and America because, you know, extremes of wealth have been justified not merely through equality of opportunity but also through a perception that philanthropy enabled wealth to be cycled back. Um, but I suspect that the first point about the American dream has sort of almost overshadowed the second point about the cultural mechanism of philanthropy. In Sweden, by contrast, which has a very um, egalitarian um, you know, perspective, and again, you can argue that M M Piketty's book exposes that Sweden is not nearly as egalitarian as many Swedes like to think. 
Um, philanthropy is not regarded as something which helps to justify inequality. And in fact, many Swedes think that it's actually wrong for charities to be engaged on a large scale with doing charitable work, because they think that's the role of the state funded by taxes. It's just a different perspective, but yeah. Well, look, I think um, one of the concerns is I think there's a recognition that Americans are very philanthropic, but I think there's a question of, you know, is that philanthropy going toward changing that reality? And it is a reality, right? Inequality is a reality, both the opportunity inequality and the wealth inequality. Um, what was interesting in our survey, though, um, Brad and Jillian, is that when you just talk to the broad base of respondents, uh, the, the percentage, I think 90% of the respondents said they'd be willing to pay higher taxes or give money toward um, trying to bridge, close that inequality gap. I think, you know, the wealthy recognize that is a problem. It's not sustainable. We've got to fix it. Uh, we've got to do it through education. That statistic I gave before shows those that are educated continue to benefit. 6.4 million jobs created versus zero which is, that's a startling, those are startling numbers that they were to me. Um, and I think there are more and more organizations out there that are trying to, you know, I've been involved with the Year Up organization, which does a great job uh, of trying to get young people in high risk areas and, and show them a, a different path and get them, at, you know, move them toward education, get them job interns. Uh, we hire some of these young people at U.S. Trust and Bank of America. Um, there's another organization that focuses on the college age children. So um, there, there are some grassroots things, but these are lost small numbers, right? It's kind of like throwing the starfish back in, right? You can't throw a thousand yeah. off the beach, but you know, the few that do get back in the water benefit. We gotta find a way to, to move the needle more quickly. And, and I, I think if, they, if people believe that the code can be cracked, I do think wealthy will aggressively support that um, for all the right reasons. Um, but we got we to gotta get it there. Right. Well, certainly I salute the Aspen Institute for ho holding so many debates about this issue, which I know is so live. But I'd like to ask one last quick, quick question myself, and sure. we're almost out of time, which is this. Another way to explain the difference in attitudes between the baby boomers and the millennials is that the baby boomers grew up in a world where the financial system was very stable and where you didn't have crises, booms, and busts every five minutes. The millennials have seen increasing instability in the financial sector. Right. Some people might argue that actually what's happening today in terms of what central bank banks around the world are doing, pumping $10 trillion worth of liquidity into the system, has created an aura of stability today with ultra low levels of rates, created this sense that the economy is recovering and the stock market's booming, but is actually setting us up for an even bigger financial crash in a few years' time. And certainly, you know, the conversations I've taken um, part in recently with central bankers would suggest to me that that's an issue on many people's minds right now. Are you concerned that that could, A, be a big threat, say, as big as geopolitical instability to the markets going forward, and B, that that could actually feed into the great concerns that millennials have about investing in normal types of financial assets? Well, look, I, I think all of that is important, and you, and you certainly need to watch how this manifests itself. But if you look at where, where the countries have been most aggressive, it's the U.S. And I will tell you what I fully believe, and I don't know what your point of view is, Jillian, that if, had, the, had the Fed and the U.S. not taken that aggressive stance they did, um, we would have gone into a depression-like state. Uh, Japan did nothing for how many years? And now, uh, 20 years, and, and now they are finally, and they're coming out of this malaise. That 20 years, you know, didn't destroy that country, but think right. of the, you know, and, and, and I'm worried now that, the, that in, in the EU, that the ECB is not being sufficiently aggressive. Look, you can, you can pull the line back in, and the Fed right. will, right? Tapering will end, the balance sheet will shrink. Rates will go up to ultimately normal levels, but at a time when the U.S. economy can withstand it. Right. And so my hope, actually, I'm more worried about the EU seemingly not doing enough and teetering on the edge of another recession. And if they get into a recession again, they're going to be dealing with deflation. And I think that's much more risky and much scarier. And one thing that we have not demonstrated an ability to know how right. to deal with. So I do think you can, you, can, you can reel the line back in. I'm not as worried about that, but you've got to make sure that once you get that acceleration, 
the tapering is done, the rates go up, and normalization is the, is the way forward. Right. Um, and that's right. what I think will be the case. So. Well, sadly, we are out of time, so we're going to have to end it here. Thank you so much for a fascinating set of discussions.